Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Rich. I am at Coastal Carolina University in Conway, South Carolina, and I am giving a presentation today at this uh, wonderful Haunted Shores conference called Among the Tentative Haunters, Shipwreck and the Uncanny. So this presentation is stemming from my uh, 2021 book called Shipwreck Hauntography, which was published by Amsterdam University Press. Uh, the book deals with shipwrecks and the uncanny, of course, um, and underwater ruins kind of more broadly. So the selection that um, I will be presenting today is from chapter three of this book, which is also called Among the Tentative Haunters. And I think it should have some clear resonance with the theme of this year's Haunted Shores Conference, um, particularly in regards to aquatic depths. As functionally liminal works of architecture, traditional sailing ships hold a special place within the human imaginary. Envisioning a ship disappearing into the horizon is to envision standing on the threshold between life and death. All ships, like all other bodies, eventually fail, and only a small fraction of those broken vessels become subject to scientific inquiry. In most cases, ancient ships are reconstructed based on information negotiated from the wreckage underwater. This negotiation requires a transcendence on the part of the human investigator, if not a transgression of the frontiers that define the very zones of our existence. In Delanda's terms, Divers surpass extensive boundaries, such as those delimiting our own ecosystem, and descend through intensive boundaries into high pressure aquatic environments. These requirements exemplify the paradox of the inherent displaceability and displacement of our physical and metaphysical limitations, as noted by Jörg Simmel. We are bounded in every direction and we are bounded in no direction, he says. Although an ostensibly simple configuration, a human conducting research underwater presents an unusually complicated epistemological challenge. To accrue the information needed to perform the miraculous intervention of raising the shipwreck, or excuse me, of raising the ship from the shipwreck, nautical archaeologists cannot rely on the primacy of vision. Indeed, sub submersion dulls or nullifies each of the five senses classically used in scientific inquiry and structural re-engineering alike. Underwater, sight is untrustworthy, smell and taste are non-existent, touch is numbed, and hearing is dominated by the sound of one's own breath. Other nonsenses betray us too, as water undermines the sense of time as both passing and linear, and even common sense declines with increasing depth. Rather than attributing the successes of nautical archaeology to the wonders of science or divine intervention alone, this chapter considers underwater epistemology as not just alien, but dystopian phenomenology. Borrowing its title from the Adrian Rich poem, Diving into the Wreck, it also challenges the way we imagine shipwrecks as haunted locales plagued by eerie vestiges of that which had been living at the surface. Instead, it attempts to address how exactly shipwreck and archaeologists confront each other within the watery medium and how roles of haunter and haunted switch through the bizarre, if not unholy, processes of nautical inquiry taking place down there. Sensory perception is an epistemic necessity. The problem of epistemology in underwater nautical archaeology, then, is particularly paradoxical. Despite a bodily composition of 70% water, human bodies immersed in bodies of water do not behave in the same way as they do on dry land. In effect, the sensorium submerged is a sensorium stunted. Vision, the sense we most commonly rely upon to perform investigations of all kinds, is diminished by water, which meter by meter absorbs the light that is not reflected from the surface. Colors with longer wavelengths, like red, disappear in the first few meters. This is why divers bleed green below five meters. Orange becomes green at eight meters, and yellow turns green at 15 meters below the surface. Green and violet have shorter wavelengths and can better penetrate the depths, but beyond 30 meters, everything is blue until water overpowers light altogether and becomes black, the color we use to describe the absence of light. Water's dark arts do not end there. 
While capable of adjusting to the loss of most color, our terrestrial and mammalian eyes also need air to focus properly. So underwater, divers wear masks to eliminate the blinding effects of excess fluid on our corneas. However, the masks we must wear also distort size and distance so that objects appear 25% closer and 33% larger than they are in reality. And beyond their physical effects on human physiology, different bodies of water have different personalities. For example, in areas of high turbidity, such as the English Channel, divers often experience zero visibility due to sediment suspended in midwater that make it impossible to see objects except for those sediments that are even inches away from the diver's eyes. In other words, the loss of color at depth and distortion of size and distance may be rendered irrelevant if there is no visibility to begin with. Because the speed of sound is dependent upon the density of the medium, hearing, the next in line in the Western hierarchy of the senses, is possible underwater because the liquid state carries sound vibrations at a pace four to five times that of air. However, the density of water also requires a greater initial force of energy to produce sound waves, and both the production and propagation of sound underwater are limited by factors including pressure from depth, particulates in the water, and ambient noise, such as boat traffic at the surface. Additionally, due to the physical properties of water, the origin of audible noise is impossible to determine by the human ear submerged. In most cases, the rhythmic sound of one's own breathing is the dominant noise underwater, when exhaling results in a curtain of bubbles bursting out of the regulator and buoyantly drifting toward the surface where gases, like the humans who depend on them, rightly belong. Of the final three senses of the sensorium, smell, touch, and taste, only touch is of any use at all while submerged. Smell and taste are obliterated by the need to breathe underwater, which is facilitated by specialized equipment that covers the nose and mouth. As for touch, this sense is hindered by the layers of neoprene and rubber that protect our earthbound bodies from the water, whose density and thermal properties constantly extract body heat from the diver's skin and lungs. With or without neoprene gloves on our hands, the water renders our flesh soft and often numb from colder ambient temperatures. The feet and hands are the first to experience heat loss prior to the body's activation of shivering and vasoconstriction in anticipation of hypothermia. To sustain the body's core temperature, divers such as those working on the Arctic sites of the HMS Terror and Erebus, both wrecked in the 1845 Franklin expedition seeking the Northwest Passage, must wear a full face mask and dry suit to limit water's direct contact with skin to only the hands and the head. Even so, being submerged in water that cold feels as though the top of one's cranium is being peeled from the rest of the skull. But the water has other effects on our bodies, impeding even those senses that fall outside the classical five of sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. Especially in deep water or in water with low visibility, visibility, divers can even lose the ability to tell the difference between up and down, surface, and seafloor. This is a particularly dangerous situation when combined with the little understood effects of nitrogen on our nervous systems when breathing compressed air at depth. Those working underwater frequently experience a lack of common sense called nitrogen narcosis. The greater the working depth, the less common sense can be relied upon. In extreme cases of nitrogen narcosis, divers may lose their sense of place, their sense of duty, or even their sense of self before drifting off into the blue and eventually suffocating when their air supply is terminated. Some divers experience this euphoric ineptitude even at shallow depths, due less to the physiological effects of nitrogen and more simply to the uncanny nature of the world underwater. It is this uncanniness that helps us begin to think of existing within water as existing in space without time. And indeed, when underwater, the sense of passing time is obfuscated so entirely that 20 minutes can seem like two, or if decompressing in midwater, two minutes seem like 200. When divers are suspended in midwater, haunted in a realm of feminine trickery, our bodily senses are closed off, this feminine power muted. Yet, as explained above, neither can the mind's sense of reason be trusted, so powerful is this realm's effect on not just the body, but the psyche held within it. In essence, water levels the, epistemolo the epistemological playing field between body and mind. This uncanny breakdown of the senses and non-senses alike is a dystopistesia, 
where procuring knowledge is also a lesson in how fleeting existence is and how feeble we are when located where we do not really belong in the first place. Not merely an atopia, a place inhospitable for human habitation, the underwater world presents humans with a dystopia where rules are overturned, inverted, and inhospitality takes a dangerous turn. While it's true that all margins are dangerous, when humans succumb to oceanic depths, objectivity itself may be recognized for the ephemeral phantom that it is. In Freud's 1919 essay explicating the uncanny, he distinguishes the uncanny, unheimlich, from other feelings within the realm of the frightening, such as fear and dread. But while fear and dread are responses to the unknown and unfamiliar, the uncanny stems specifically from the unease that emerges from what was once well known and had long been familiar. The womb features prominently in his theory of the uncanny as it epitomizes the ambivalence of the heimlich and unheimlich, where the prefix un indicates repression. The womb is everyone's first home and so must be heimlich, yet everyone leaves the womb never to return, making encounters with it also fundamentally unheimlich. Bracke Ettinger counters Freud's phallocentric accounts of uncanny experiences and encounters by expounding a theory of matrixial fantasy, where the uncanny is sparked by a resurgence of repressed memories, not of separation or rifts, but of being conjoined and simultaneously partial. Hers is therefore a prenatal account of the uncanny where connection is umbilical and incompletion is fetal. Thus the doppelganger effect is not due to castration anxiety, but rather the prenatal anxiety of having lived within another body that is both the same as and differentiated from one's own. Likewise, disconcerting feelings of deja vu surfaced when partial times and partial memories overlap with present experience. The diver descending through womb-like oceans to the seafloor enters at once a physically matrixial space and a psychically matrixial fantasy. It is the epitome of anamnesis or the recurrence of an immemorial but ever-present primal scene. When the diver encounters a shipwreck there in the midst of this originary tableau vivant, the experience is doubly uncanny. First, in accordance with Ettinger's account of intrauterine experience and partiality as essence, but also in the Freudian sense of the traumatic split as the circumstances of fragmentation and displacement redefine the encounter. In psychoanalytic terms, the encounter between shipwreck and diver exists at the threshold of pre and postnatal experience. The encroachment of fantasy upon reality, so characteristic of the uncanny, is inverted, which only adds to the challenge of knowing through dystopian phenomenology. This leads to another kind of inversion that takes place within the matrixial border space between shipwreck and diver. Shipwrecks are often fantasized as haunted locales where spirits of drowned sailors dwell. Yet we, the living, also haunt the wreckage. We somehow intermittently appear, drifting in a world for which we are no longer suited, grabbing at what there is in an attempt to complete our perpetually unfinished business. A close reading of Adrian Rich's poem, Diving into the Wreck, demonstrates the extent and uncanniness of inversion in such underwater encounters. The poem's remarkable relevance here lies in its ability to be read metaphorically as a critique of patriarchy and more literally as a diver exploring a shipwreck and both readings resonate. The diver, a woman, dons the awkward and anonymizing if not androgenizing or masculinizing equipment, fins, mask, and body armor of black rubber and slowly descends down a ladder on the side of a schooner and into the ocean. First the air is blue and then it is bluer and then green and then black. I am blacking out and yet my mask is powerful. Confronted by the dystopastesia of submersion, she is reliant upon her equipment to convert her body into one more suitable for this amniotic environment. However, her sensory adaptation is only the first part of coping without what with being completely out of her element. I have to learn alone to turn my body without force in the deep element. In the depths, she experiences the further dissolution of perception. And now it is so easy to forget what I came for among so many who have always lived here, swaying their crenellated fans between the reefs and besides you breathe differently down here. At last, she remembers that she came to explore the damage done and inspect what still prevails, what truths can still be sal salvaged from mythic destruction. 
the thing I came for, the wreck and not the story of the wreck, the thing itself and not the myth, the drowned face always staring toward the sun, the evidence of damage worn by salt and sway into this threadbare beauty, the ribs of the disaster curving their assertion among the tentative haunters. The ghostly haunters proceeding with great caution are none other than the divers themselves. We circle silently about the wreck we dive into the hold. In a perspectival shift, it is the ship wreck who finds itself lying in silence among the tentative haunters, shifting again back into the human perspective. In the broken belly of the wreck, the narrating haunter finds the corpse of a drowned sailor. I am she, I am he, whose drowned face sleeps with open eyes, whose breasts still bear the stress. Despite having uncannily come face to face with the putrefied other, it is not he who haunts the wreck, but she, she who re-enters the forbidden matrix, and within that amniotic realm, she makes her way into yet another abdominal cavity, the hull of the sunken ship, complete with rotting sailor and ruined cargo and fouled compass. Her own body is barely recognizable, circling unintelligibly, coming and going intermittently, unwelcome, yet perennially returning. Her scientific questions are never fully answered, her business of inquisition always left unfinished. This type of inversion, wherein the roles of haunted and haunter are switched, recalls Julia Kristeva's abjection of self. The diver is drawn toward and elsewhere as tempting as it is condemned by a vortex of summons and repulsions that places the one haunted by it literally beside herself. The self becomes a deject, straying from identity and purpose toward the increasing danger of being an exile willingly entered into dystopia. And at this point, the encounter between diver and shipwreck transcends the uncanny and embraces the abject. A massive and sudden emergence of uncanniness, which familiar as it might have been in an opaque and forgotten life, now harries me as radically separate, loathsome. Swimming alongside shipwreck, the meaning of weightlessness is entangled with the weight of meaninglessness. The abjection of meaninglessness amidst dystopia produces panic, which can only be controlled through sublimation. Thus, the abject is edged with the sublime, a sublime alienation that threatens to forfeit existence when swallowed by the very thing that fascinates, the thing that haunts the haunter. If I panic underwater, I find myself on the edge of non-existence and hallucination of a reality that, if I acknowledge it, annihilates me. To prevent becoming engulfed by oblivion, the haunter must find a way to regain some semblance of control lest she succumb to the same fate as the wreck she haunts. Circling the dead while skirting death, the act of haunting is quite properly eerie. The presence of the past often can be felt only indirectly, and so we extend our, our senses beyond our comfort zones. In his biopsychological treatise, De Anima, Aristotle posits that sensory relationships are composed of three participants, organ, object, and medium. The medium in our case is water. This medium cannot be overcome no matter how extravagant our mitigating equipment or our eliminating algorithms. Instead, the medium must be consulted. Through kinesthesia or sensing through movement, the haunting diver becomes the organ, navigating the shipwreck through awareness of the placement of one's body in relation to it as the sensible object. Similarly, the diver might come to sense distance and time by part of the wreck site, uh, sorry, by acknowledging how much physical exertion it takes to move from one part of the wreck site to another in a manner similar to proprioception or <clears throat> movements of the body in relation to each other. While no single sense remains fully intact underwater, Coanesthesia, or the amalgamation of bits of information gathered through all the available senses, may be enough to stave off abjection induced oblivion or panic. Finally, something that might be called anesthesia allows for information to be acquired collectively by groups of divers working together, perceiving differences, and corroborating varied, varied aesthetic experiences until a consensus may be formed. And yet, a deeper dive into alternatives to sensory perception reveals that the haunter's sensorium, necessarily revised for the dual sakes of survival and science, may include some even stranger senses than these. So I'll leave off there. Um, if you are interested in um, <laughs> hearing a bit more about this, um, or if you'd even like you know, a copy of the entire book, please just reach out to me.
Um, I would be happy to uh, to share the PDF with you of either the book or, or this particular chapter if that's all you're interested in, which is perfectly fine. And so at this point, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and wish you all many an uncanny adventure into the deep. Any questions, um, please direct them to my email address at srich2 at coastal.edu. Um, you can also tweet me at Racks and Ruins. So thank you once again, and please enjoy the rest of the conference.